You're listening ad-free on Amazon Music. In the middle of the night on January 25th, 2014, 80-year-old Peggy Nadell was sound asleep in her second-story bedroom. And then suddenly, her phone began to ring. Peggy woke up startled and looked over at the clock and saw it was past 1 a.m. And so to be getting a call this late could only mean one thing. This was bad news. And so nervously, Peggy answered the phone and quietly said hello. Peggy would be correct. This phone call was bad news. But it was far worse than anything Peggy could have imagined. And moments after getting that call, Peggy would be fighting for her life. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of The Strange, Dark, and Mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right podcast because that's all we do and we upload twice a week, once on Monday and once on Thursday. So if that's of interest to you, please replace the Amazon Music Follow Button's cookies with dog treats. Okay, let's get into today's story. On a December afternoon in 2013, 80-year-old Peggy Nadell gazed out of her second-story bedroom window, watching the snow fall onto the ground below. Peggy's large gray wooden house sat tucked away in Valley Cottage, New York, a small upscale enclave located in Clarkstown, less than an hour northwest of New York City. Peggy had lived in this house for 50 years. She loved her small town, and she thought there was something really special about it in the winter. The snow made everything quiet, beautiful, and almost otherworldly. In her bedroom, Peggy glanced down at her watch. She felt like she could stand there for hours just staring at the snowfall, but she had some place to be, and Peggy hated being late. So she walked out of her room and down a hallway across an old hardwood floor to the stairs. Peggy held onto the banister and slowly made her way to the first floor. At 80 years old, Peggy was still in great shape. She exercised almost every day at the nearby Jewish community center, And even when there was snow on the ground and it was freezing outside, she still enjoyed walking around town or in the public park that was close to her house. But Peggy admitted that the stairs in her house had begun to get a bit tricky for her. And her daughter, Suzanne, had become paranoid that Peggy was going to take a bad fall and hurt herself on the stairs. So Peggy, not wanting to worry her family, now made it a point to take her time when she was going up and down the stairs and to always hold on to the banister. Peggy finally reached the first floor, and she walked across the living room towards the front of the house. Peggy's house was almost like a museum, and also a time capsule. There were paintings hung on the walls, and small sculptures and other pieces of art that could be found on tables and shelves in the living room. But there was also 50 years' worth of family keepsakes, photos of her grown children at almost every age, and some recent drawings her grandkids had made for her. Peggy pulled a long coat off a coat rack by the front door, and she put it on over her black sweater. Peggy had short brown hair that she styled every day, and she wore red lipstick. Peggy had been obsessed with fashion from a young age, and that obsession had never really gone away. So she always tried to look and dress her best whenever she left the house. Peggy grabbed a leather bag that contained books, notebooks, and pens. Then she set the house alarm by pushing on a keypad by the door, and then she walked outside across the porch to her car parked in the driveway. Peggy got in, started the car, turned on the radio, and began heading towards New York City. After driving into the city and parking her car, Peggy made her way through a big throng of people walking down Fifth Ave in Manhattan. She looked at the holiday decorations and Christmas lights hanging around the street, and she had a huge smile on her face. As much as Peggy loved living in her sleepy little town, there was nothing quite like being in the big city. Over the course of her life, Peggy had traveled all over the world. She'd seen Roman ruins, the pyramids in Egypt, and she'd laid on beautiful beaches all around the globe. But New York City had always been a very special place for her. Peggy walked for a few minutes and then stepped into a white stone building that housed one of the City University of New York's campuses in the area. Inside, Peggy made her way to a small classroom where she was sitting in on a PhD-level art history class. Peggy said hello to some of the other students who had already arrived. Many of them were at least 50 years younger than she was. Peggy made it to her seat. She pulled off her coat and put it on the back of her chair. Then she sat down and grabbed her notebook out of her bag. A young woman sitting nearby smiled, and Peggy smiled back. Peggy knew she must be a bit of a mystery to most of her fellow students. They must have wondered why this well-dressed old lady was in class with them. But anybody who knew Peggy even reasonably well knew that she had always prized learning and education above almost anything else. 
Back in the mid-1950s, Peggy had fallen in love with a man named Robert Nadell, and she had gotten married to him. And not long after they got married, Peggy gave birth to their daughter, Suzanne. Then, a couple of years later, Peggy had their son, Jim. And Peggy loved being a mother, but she didn't want to just stay at home. So she had decided to go back to school to get her MBA, a graduate business degree. Her husband, Robert, had been totally thrilled about her decision. He thought Peggy was one of the smartest people he'd ever met, and he knew how important education was to her. But at the time, most other people around Peggy had thought she was crazy for wanting to go back to school for anything, especially a master's degree in business, because at this time in the 1960s, women represented less than 1% of students at the top MBA programs in the United States. But Peggy believed it was her duty to continue learning as much as she could, and she had refused to accept that being a woman had anything to do with her ability to succeed in business school or the corporate world. And so after getting her MBA, Peggy had proven everybody who doubted her wrong. She had gone on to work for Xerox, a huge corporation that was a pioneer in photocopiers and other technology products. And after years of working at that company, Peggy had become one of Xerox's first female executives. Peggy had a long and very successful career, and when she had finally stepped away from her work, she enjoyed retirement right alongside her husband, Robert. They had loved to travel, and they had spent a lot of their time helping their community by volunteering for local groups and charities. And as much as Peggy had loved her high-powered executive job, she actually enjoyed the volunteer work that she and Robert were able to do even more. But then, in 2003, Robert had died unexpectedly, and suddenly Peggy had found herself all alone in her big old house. Peggy's daughter, Suzanne, lived about 20 minutes away, and so the mother and daughter spent a lot of time together. But Peggy knew Suzanne had a life and a job that kept her busy, and Peggy didn't want to give up on all the things that made her happy just because she was on her own now. She wanted to keep learning about new things and experiencing new things. So Peggy had begun to study art history, a subject she'd always been interested in. And eventually, she decided she wanted to learn as much as she possibly could about art history. So at 80 years old, Peggy began sitting in on these PhD-level art history classes not to get another degree, but just because she really loved it and wanted to learn more. Peggy listened closely and took extensive notes during the professor's lecture. And as Peggy wrote in her notebook, she almost felt like a kid again. She knew how absurd that would sound to the others in the class. After all, she was a mother and a grandmother, and she had lived a full life by this point. But Peggy felt like learning new things was really the best way to stay active and engaged in the world around her. Later that night, Peggy was in her bedroom, still thinking about what she learned that day in class, as she changed out of her clothes into her nightgown. Then, once she was changed, she sat down on her bed, and she grabbed the home phone off the bedside table. Now, there were two people Peggy usually talked to multiple times a day. Her daughter, Suzanne, and her daughter-in-law, Diana. Peggy knew both women liked to check on her a lot to make sure she was okay. Suzanne was paranoid about Peggy falling down the stairs, and Diana, who was married to Peggy's son and lived in Florida, worried about Peggy going out and driving when it was cold and snowing. Peggy regularly reminded her daughter and daughter-in-law that she was more than capable of taking care of herself, but she did love talking to them both and staying in touch. So Peggy called her daughter, Suzanne, and told her all about the day's art history class. Then, after she was done speaking to Suzanne, Peggy called Diana in Florida. Now, Peggy's son was not much for phone calls, so his wife, Diana, was really Peggy's only real connection to her grandkids who lived so far away. Peggy told Diana that she really missed everybody and that she was hoping she could pay for Diana and her son's two kids to come visit her in New York that summer. When Diana heard that, she got really excited and said the kids would love that. Eventually, the two women wrapped up the call and said goodnight, and then Peggy hung up the phone and walked over to the bedroom window. It was still snowing outside, and the snowflakes seemed to glow under the streetlights. Peggy was still struck by how beautiful the winter scene always looked, but now that she knew her grandkids were very likely coming to visit her, she could not wait for summer to arrive. Over a month later, on January 24, 2014, Peggy was in her room getting ready for bed again. Peggy had kept busy over the recent holiday season. She'd spent the first night of Hanukkah with her daughter Suzanne, and she'd also talked to her daughter-in-law Diana and her grandkids in Florida almost every day. She'd gone to various holiday parties in town with close friends, and she continued to exercise at the Jewish Community Center. But despite how fun the holiday season had been, it still totally wore Peggy out, and she was still feeling tired weeks later. <laughs> 
so she was hoping to sleep in late the following morning and get caught up on some much-needed rest. It hadn't snowed in weeks, but temperatures had dropped to a freezing 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was cold and drafty inside of Peggy's old house. So she climbed into bed and pulled a whole pile of warm blankets over her. Then she turned off the lamp on her bedside table and eventually drifted off to sleep. But just a few hours later, at 1.17 a.m., so this is now on January 25th, Peggy woke up startled. Her home phone was ringing on the bedside table right next to her, and the sound had pulled her out of her dream. She took a breath and got her bearings, and then leaned over and flipped the switch on the lamp. Peggy looked at the clock next to the phone and saw how late it was, and she started to panic because she was worried that a phone call at this hour could only mean something bad had happened. Peggy sat up in bed and cautiously answered the phone, and then after talking to the caller for about a minute, Peggy relaxed. Now, Peggy was still a bit shocked from getting a call in the middle of the night that woke her up, but there was no emergency or any bad news. Peggy just had a couple of unexpected late-night visitors standing outside of her house. So Peggy got out of her bed, she walked to her closet and put on her robe and slippers, then she headed downstairs and walked to the front door. She opened the door and smiled at the two people standing outside. But before she could let her visitors in, a loud, very high-pitched beeping sound began echoing through Peggy's house. Peggy had forgotten to turn off the house alarm before she opened the door. Peggy quickly punched in the code on the keypad right near the door, and it turned the alarm off, but the phone in the kitchen started ringing, so Peggy rushed to go grab it. The alarm company was calling to see if everything was okay, and Peggy would give them a password to let them know it really was her, and then she told them everything was fine. Then she hung up the phone and called out to her visitors to come inside. And they did. They joined Peggy in the kitchen, and she poured each of them a glass of water. Then the three of them sat at the kitchen table and talked for a few minutes, and then Peggy stood up and excused herself. Peggy walked through the living room and went up the stairs to the second floor bathroom, which was a lot warmer than the one on the first floor. But when Peggy was done and about to leave the bathroom, she heard shouting outside and footsteps on the stairs. And so Peggy stepped out of the bathroom, and she was surprised to see her two visitors were standing right there outside. They were quiet and kind of awkward, and Peggy thought maybe the two of them were in the middle of some kind of argument that she had now just kind of butted herself into. But Peggy smiled at them and said, let's go down to the kitchen and keep on talking. Then Peggy walked past them, put her hand on the banister, and began walking down the steps. And the two visitors followed her. But before reaching the bottom of the stairs, Peggy heard one of her visitors begin to scream right behind her. Several hours later, at 9 a.m. on January 25th, so almost eight hours after the visitors had arrived at Peggy's house, Peggy's daughter, Suzanne, stepped out of her car in front of Peggy's house. Suzanne was 55 years old with frizzy, dyed blonde hair. She wore jeans, tennis shoes, a t-shirt, and a big winter coat. Suzanne had not inherited her mother's love of fashion. Instead, Suzanne preferred comfort over style. Suzanne walked quickly to the front door. It was bitterly cold out, but Suzanne barely noticed. She had woken up that morning and called her mother like she did almost every day, but Peggy hadn't answered. There was a chance Peggy could have just slept in or gone out to exercise, but Suzanne had tried calling back a little bit later, and Peggy still didn't answer. So Suzanne had called her sister-in-law, Diana, because she knew Diana usually called Peggy several times a day too, and Diana said she had called Peggy too at around 7.30 that morning, but Peggy didn't pick up, and so Diana said she left a message, but still had not heard back yet. After talking to Diana, Suzanne was worried enough that she decided to just drive over to her mother's house to make sure everything was okay. Once Suzanne reached her mother's porch, she reached into her pocket and pulled out the key she had to her mother's house. She used it to open up the door, and then once she was inside, she called out for her mother, but there was no answer. So Suzanne began walking around the first floor of the house, and when Suzanne walked into the living room, she let out a blood-curdling scream. Suzanne saw Peggy's crumpled body on the floor at the bottom of the stairs. Suzanne instinctively ran to her mother, and when she got a good look at her, she saw there was a knife sticking out of Peggy's chest. And so Suzanne dropped down and just yanked the knife out and threw it on the floor, and then she leaned in and touched her mother's face, 
and she could feel that Peggy's skin had gone totally ice cold. Totally distraught, Suzanne took out her cell phone and dialed 911. When the emergency dispatcher answered, Suzanne began yelling that she needed help and that her mother must have fallen down the stairs while holding a knife and she accidentally stabbed herself. Not long after the 911 call, Detectives Stephen Cole Hatchard and Earl Lawrence of the Clarkstown Police Department pulled up in a sedan outside of Peggy's house and stepped out of the car. The snow had started again and they could feel the cold biting into their hands and faces. Local police had already run crime scene tape all across the front of Peggy's house, and some of Peggy's neighbors had already begun to gather nearby. Hatchard and Lawrence also saw Peggy's daughter, Suzanne, pacing back and forth in the driveway, a few feet in front of a uniformed police officer. Suzanne was mumbling to herself, and she looked totally dazed. The detectives approached Suzanne and introduced themselves, and Suzanne immediately repeated what she had said to the 911 operator. Her mother must have fallen down the stairs while she was holding a knife and accidentally stabbed herself. Suzanne said she had been worried about her mother on those stairs for a long time. But before the detectives could even really process what Suzanne was talking about, she would say something that sent up multiple red flags. Suzanne told Hatchard and Lawrence that police would likely find her fingerprints on the knife because she had pulled the knife out of her mother's chest before trying to administer CPR on her mother. And Suzanne said her fingerprints were all over the house because she went to visit her mom there all the time. But Suzanne didn't stop there. She just kept on talking. And she would tell the detectives that her mom was really rich, but she said this was not how she wanted to inherit her cut of her mom's estate. Detective Hatchard told Suzanne to wait with the officer outside and that they would talk to her once they had searched the house. Then Hatchard and Lawrence walked towards the front door while Suzanne began pacing in the driveway again. The detectives couldn't believe what they had just learned. They hadn't even stepped inside the house yet, but already Peggy's daughter had admitted to tampering with evidence by pulling the knife out of her mother's chest. Suzanne had also tried to cover for the fact that her fingerprints would be found on a potential weapon and throughout the house. And she had given a clear motive for possibly having killed her mother by talking about Peggy's money. That said, Hatchard and Lawrence knew that people under stress could act in strange ways, especially when dealing with the death of a loved one. But neither of them had ever encountered anything like what had just happened with Suzanne. It sort of seemed like she had worked up a big cover story and then blurted all of it out as soon as cops showed up. Inside the house, detectives Hatchard and Lawrence found a small group of forensics officers searching for fingerprints, blood samples, and other physical evidence. When the local police had first arrived on the scene, they really weren't sure what they were dealing with, or if Suzanne's story about her mom falling with the knife was true, so a forensics team and the detectives had been called in. But when Hatchard and Lawrence reached the bottom of Peggy's stairs, they didn't need forensics officers to tell them that Suzanne's version of what happened was totally off. On the ground in front of the detectives was Peggy Nadell. She was dead and lying face up on the floor. The detectives crouched down and right away saw multiple knife wounds in Peggy's chest, and they saw the knife that Suzanne said she had removed lying on the floor nearby. And when detectives looked more closely at Peggy's body, they began to notice wounds on the side of her head as though she had been struck with a blunt object several times. And right near Peggy's face was this small sculpture, which was the bust of someone's head, and then near Peggy's hand was a gold metal ball, another piece of art. And so maybe those two things were the blunt object that had been smashed into Peggy. Also, the detectives saw bruising around Peggy's neck and throat, which most likely indicated that Peggy had been strangled at some point. In short, there was no way Peggy had just tumbled down the stairs while holding a knife, and that was how she accidentally killed herself. Clearly, this was a murder. Hatchard and Lawrence were appalled by what they saw. Any violent crime was bad enough, but neither of them could understand what type of person would attack a defenseless 80-year-old woman. The detectives assumed Peggy must have been struck in the head with either the small sculpture or that golden ball that were laying close by her body, but forensics officers said no fingerprints or physical evidence had been found on either of those objects. It was like they had both been wiped clean. So the detectives stepped away from Peggy's body and walked upstairs and went to search Peggy's bedroom. In the bedroom, they saw a few dresser drawers were laid out on the floor, and there was an open jewelry box on top of the dresser. 
Someone had clearly rifled through the jewelry box, but it was still filled with several expensive pieces. Hatchard and Lawrence looked around the rest of the room, and when they were done with their cursory check, they both had the same thought. This was not a robbery. If anything, this was a weak attempt by Peggy's killer to make it look like a robbery. By 1 p.m., so about four hours after Suzanne made that 911 call, Hatchard and Lawrence had finished their initial search of the crime scene and had briefed their boss on what they had found. They weren't sure exactly what had happened in the house, but they knew there was only one place to start their investigation, and that was with Peggy's daughter, Suzanne. Later that afternoon, Hatchard and Lawrence sat in a comfortable police station conference room across a long table from Suzanne. They wanted Suzanne to be able to talk freely and feel comfortable, which is why they had not brought her into a cramped interrogation room. The detectives had not found any direct evidence to pin Peggy's murder on Suzanne, but they had heard Suzanne's bizarre statements she made at the house, and they felt like that was definitely enough to go on. Detective Hatchard started by asking Suzanne to explain why she had been at Peggy's house in the first place. Suzanne talked about not being able to get a hold of her mom and how her sister-in-law Diana had had the same issue, so Suzanne had gone by her mother's house to check on Peggy. After all, Peggy was 80 years old, she lived alone, so Suzanne checked on her a lot. That made total sense to Hatchard and Lawrence, but then Hatchard asked Suzanne why she had been so preoccupied with her fingerprints potentially being found on the knife. And Suzanne's answer to this seemed even weirder than some of the stuff she'd said at the house. Suzanne leaned across the table and told them she watched a lot of TV shows and news programs about murder, so she knew the cops would very likely be looking at Peggy's family members as suspects, and so she wanted to clear herself. Hatchard and Lawrence could tell Suzanne really believed saying this was actually going to help her, but they thought this made her look even more guilty. Here was a person who watched TV shows that demonstrated how law enforcement tracked down killers, and then she had taken steps like tampering with a murder weapon that could throw investigators off her trail. The detectives ended up questioning Suzanne for several hours that afternoon, and at the end of it, as far as the detectives were concerned, Suzanne had done nothing to clear herself of her mother's murder. During the interview, Suzanne seemed kind of erratic, and she kept bringing up her inheritance. She said her mom was worth about $4 million, and now that she was dead, Suzanne would get half of it. By the end of the interview, several police officers who were watching the interview thought Hatchard and Lawrence had gotten enough damning statements from Suzanne to actually put her in custody. But the detectives knew that if they did that, word would very quickly spread all across the area that Suzanne had been arrested for murdering her mother. And once that rumor was out there, people would have a really hard time ever changing their minds about what they thought Suzanne had done, even if it was proven later on that Suzanne was actually innocent. So Hatchard and Lawrence talked over their various options, and ultimately they just didn't feel like they had enough evidence yet to justify holding Suzanne and potentially destroying her reputation. So they let her go. But as soon as Suzanne was out of the police station, Hatchard and Lawrence called a judge and they got a warrant to conduct full-time surveillance on Suzanne. Police would get stationed outside of Suzanne's home and her work, and they would watch her at those two locations and follow her anytime she left them. In the following days, along with conducting their around-the-clock surveillance, investigators began digging into Suzanne's recent credit card history, and they found another huge red flag. On the night of January 24th, so just hours before Suzanne's mother would be killed, Suzanne had gone shopping at a grocery store that was close to Peggy's house. But based on her credit card records, this was not where Suzanne typically did her shopping. She went to a store that was much closer to her own home. But it was not just this grocery store's location that seemed kind of suspicious. On the night in question, investigators learned that Suzanne purchased rubber gloves and cleaning supplies. Hatchard and Lawrence felt like this was just one more thing that pointed towards Suzanne's guilt. After all, rubber gloves and cleaning supplies could explain why there were no fingerprints found at the crime scene. And so the detectives were confident they were on the right track, and they thought if Suzanne had killed her mother, she would slip up soon and they would be there to arrest her. 
At 11 a.m. on January 29, 2014, four days after Peggy's murder, Suzanne sat in a wooden pew in a funeral home next to her husband. Her eyes were bloodshot, and her whole body felt like it was trembling. The pews around her were filled with Peggy's friends, family, and members of the Valley Cottage community who Peggy had gone out of her way to help. Even though police had not arrested Suzanne, word had already spread that she was a primary suspect. And a couple of days earlier, when Suzanne had gone to her mother's house to pick out clothes for her mother to be buried in, a neighbor had stepped outside. And this woman, who had known Suzanne since she was just a little girl, began screaming, when are you going to arrest her? And so the rumors and the pressure were really starting to get to Suzanne, and it was making it hard to sleep at night. Towards the end of the service, Suzanne and others recited a prayer in Hebrew, and then Suzanne quickly made her way out of the funeral home. Once outside, Suzanne welcomed the fresh cold air. It was like she could breathe again. Inside, she'd felt stifled because she felt like everybody was staring at her and talking about her. A minute later, Suzanne's younger brother Jim and his wife Diana came outside and walked over to her. They had flown in from Florida shortly after they learned about Peggy's death, and Suzanne could not have been happier they were here. Suzanne said hello to her brother, who she always thought was kind of strange, and then she hugged Diana, who she was very close with, and they talked for a while about how much Peggy had meant to them. But as they stood there chatting, they had no idea the police were watching. Not long after Peggy's funeral, Detectives Hatchard and Lawrence met with Suzanne's brother, Jim, and his wife, Diana, at the police station. The detectives asked them basic questions, like where they had been on the night before the murder. Jim had been at his house in Florida, and Diana had been at a wedding most of the day. Diana would say that she had called Peggy on the morning of the murder, but didn't get an answer. And then she also said she'd spoken to Suzanne right before Suzanne had gone to Peggy's house and discovered Peggy's body. Hatchard and Lawrence would, of course, follow up on Jim and Diana's statements, but the detectives really wanted information on Suzanne. They wanted to know if Suzanne had spoken to Jim and Diana about the inheritance money that Suzanne seemed so eager to tell police about. But Diana said the idea that Suzanne had anything to do with this murder was ridiculous. She said Suzanne loved her mom, and she was closer to Peggy than basically anybody else in the world. And so Diana said the police really needed to stop wasting their time looking at Suzanne and bring the person who actually killed Peggy to justice. But when Jim and Diana left the police station after their interview, the detectives still totally believed Suzanne was their most likely suspect. Family members sticking up for each other was not anything new. But over the next few weeks, surveillance on Suzanne did not get Hatchard and Lawrence any closer to having concrete evidence that she was in fact the killer. Still, Hatchard and Lawrence hoped that even if Suzanne's actions didn't lead them anywhere, that maybe her phone records soon would. Investigator Robin Arias sat at her desk staring at hundreds of numbers printed on a piece of paper. Most people's eyes would probably have glazed over staring at all those numbers for as long as Arias had, but she could feel her pulse racing as she scanned the sheet of paper over and over. Arias was an investigator with the Westchester County District Attorney's Office, and she was an expert at analyzing phone data. Arias had begun working with Detectives Hatchard and Lawrence on Peggy's murder case, and currently she was studying calls that Suzanne made, and she was also looking at Peggy's phone records. Arias confirmed that Suzanne called Peggy multiple times before calling 911 on the morning of the murder. Arias also confirmed that Diana had also called Peggy and had spoken to Suzanne on that same morning. But now, there was something on one of the sheets of paper, something from Peggy's phone records, that really leapt out at Arias. She could see that someone had called Peggy at exactly 1.17 a.m. on the morning of the murder. And this was a big deal because that time was basically right before Peggy was killed. But there was something else that struck Arias as odd about this call. The call had come from a number that didn't show up anywhere else in Peggy's phone records. Arias was checking the records to make sure she was right, but she was convinced that that late night call was made by someone that Peggy did not normally speak to. And so finally, after scanning the pages several more times, Arias was sure she was right about that phone number, that it was really unique. So she grabbed her own phone and she made a few calls. Detective Hatchard was at his desk going over notes from Peggy's murder case when Arias called him. And as soon as Hatchard answered, he could tell Arias had big news. 
She was known to be very calm, cool, and collected basically all the time, but immediately Hatchard could hear the excitement in Arius' voice. Arius told Hatchard about the strange number that had popped up in Peggy's phone records just before her murder. But Arius said this was just the tip of the iceberg. She looked into that number and learned that it came from a phone that was not actually registered to anyone. It was something called a burner phone. A burner phone is typically a cheap cell phone that's purchased just for temporary use or to keep the user's identity anonymous. Hatchard listened to Arius, and he felt like she had just helped the investigation take a huge step forward. But then, Arius gave him the most important piece of information of all. Arius had worked for hours and hours and pulled some strings, and she had figured out where this burner phone had been purchased from and who had bought it. Hatchard thanked Arius profusely for all her help, then he hung up the phone and rushed over to Lawrence's desk to tell him what he'd just learned. It would take the detectives a while to follow up on all the information Arius had provided them, but once they had gone through all of it, they would figure out who killed Peggy. Based on Robin Arias' phone data analysis, evidence found at the crime scene, and interviews conducted throughout the investigation, here is a reconstruction of what police believe occurred in the early morning hours of January 25, 2014, when someone murdered Peggy Nadell in the home she had lived in for 50 years. On that day, just after 1 a.m., the killers, plural, drove through the town center of Valley Cottage. And there was something about the place that almost didn't seem real, like it was a movie set version of a perfect small town. The killers looked at each other, but didn't speak. They knew what they were about to do would leave this entire community in complete shock. A few minutes later, the driver pulled onto Peggy Street and then parked in front of Peggy's large gray house. A few porch lights were on at some of the nearby houses, but overall the neighborhood was totally quiet. In the car, the passenger reached into their pocket, took out a phone, and called Peggy's home phone number. This was the call that came through at 1.17 a.m. The passenger's voice was bright and cheery when Peggy picked up on the other line. The passenger said they were so sorry to call late, but they had been in the neighborhood and they really needed to come in and talk to Peggy face-to-face about something. Peggy seemed frazzled, but she said to give her a few minutes to pull herself together, and she'd come downstairs and let them in. The passenger hung up and then handed the phone to the driver, who slipped it into their pocket. Then the passenger reached down into a bag that was on the floorboard and pulled out two pairs of gloves and handed one of the pairs to the driver. Both killers put the gloves into their coat pockets. Then the driver reached into the back seat and grabbed a small leather bag that had a strap on it, and the driver slung that bag over their shoulder. The killers then looked at each other and then stepped out of the car into the frigid winter air and began walking across the yard towards Peggy's front door. As soon as they reached the front door, Peggy opened it up with a big smile on her face. But before the killers could step inside, Peggy's alarm system went off and the phone in the kitchen began to ring. The killers waited while Peggy dealt with the alarm company and then they walked into the house and joined Peggy in the kitchen. The killers sat down at the table and Peggy brought them some water They all sat and talked for a few minutes before Peggy said she had to go use the bathroom and headed upstairs. While Peggy was upstairs, one of the killers, the passenger in the car, said it was time to act and that the driver needed to be the one to actually do the job on their own. But the driver said no, they both needed to do it to make sure Peggy didn't fight back. But the passenger just barked back that, come on, Peggy's an old woman, it won't take two people. And pretty soon, the two killers were basically shouting at each other. But quickly they stopped because they did know they did need to act soon and ultimately they agreed they would do it together. So the killers slipped on their gloves and the driver took the leather strap off of their bag and then the killers ran out of the kitchen, through the living room, and up the stairs. But when Peggy walked out of the bathroom and saw them, the killers just kind of froze there staring up at her awkwardly. Peggy smiled at them and didn't really know what to make of this, so she walked past them and just began walking down the stairs, and the killers followed her. But as they were going down the stairs, the killers knew that if they were going to do it, they needed to do it right now. So the driver just suddenly screamed and rushed Peggy from behind and wrapped that leather strap from the bag around Peggy's throat 
Peggy and the driver stumbled down the stairs and hit the floor on the first floor. And the driver just kept pulling that leather strap tighter and tighter, strangling Peggy. But Peggy was somehow managing to put up a pretty good fight. The driver began to yell in frustration that this woman won't die. So the passenger ran into the living room and grabbed two pieces of art, a small bust of a person and a gold metal ball. And the passenger ran back to the stairs with these objects in their hands. When the driver saw the passenger carrying these weapons, the driver let go of their stranglehold on Peggy and kind of backed away. And then the passenger kind of looked at the two objects in their hands and dropped the lighter gold ball onto the floor, opting to use the bust instead. Then the passenger got down on their knees, held up the small statue, and began slamming it over and over again into the side of Peggy's head. Blood spilled from the wound and Peggy flopped over onto her back. Eventually, the passenger dropped the statue on the floor and backed away. And as the killers stood there staring at their victim, they began to hear breathing still rattling from Peggy's chest. So, without hesitation, the passenger ran to the kitchen, threw open a drawer, and grabbed a large kitchen knife. Seconds later, the passenger ran back to the base of the stairs, they got down on top of Peggy, and just began stabbing her over and over and over again in the chest, until Peggy stopped breathing, went limp, and died. The passenger just left the knife plunged into Peggy's chest, and then the passenger stood up, and the two killers ran back to the kitchen, where they grabbed their cleaning supplies, and they wiped down their water glasses, and then they ran back over to the foot of the stairs, and they cleaned off the statue that had been used to bludgeon Peggy. They also wiped down the knife handle and the gold metal ball. Then the killers went upstairs to Peggy's room, and there they put a couple of dresser drawers out on the floor and took a few pieces of jewelry from a jewelry box in an attempt to make it look like Peggy's murder had just been the result of a robbery. Satisfied with their work, the killers walked downstairs, stepped over Peggy's body, went outside, and got back into their car. The passenger then told the driver to dispose of that burner phone and also dispose of the leather strap they had used to strangle Peggy. The driver said they would, and then the pair drove off. Several hours later, the passenger killer was heading to an airport in Washington, D.C. when their phone rang. It was their sister-in-law calling. The passenger answered the phone and then told their sister-in-law that they too had called Peggy earlier that morning, but Peggy hadn't answered and they had no idea why. It would turn out Suzanne had nothing to do with her mother's murder. But Suzanne's sister-in-law, so Peggy's own daughter-in-law, Diana did murder Peggy. Suzanne's strange behavior following her mother's murder had most likely been a combination of grief and shock. And the fact that Suzanne had bought rubber gloves and cleaning supplies just hours before the murder was nothing more than a truly unfortunate coincidence. But it turned out that Suzanne was not the only person in the family who had spent time thinking about the millions of dollars in inheritance money that would come their way if Peggy died. Diana had thought about that money a lot, and she knew that her family would get $2 million, so half of Peggy's wealth, when Peggy was dead. But there was a catch. Diana had discovered that Peggy stipulated in her will that Diana would get nothing if she and Jim, so Peggy's son, got divorced. And Diana had badly wanted to divorce Jim. But when Diana had learned about Peggy's will and that stipulation... She realized she had to make sure Jim got a share of Peggy's money before she left Jim. Then, once Jim had his millions, Diana could get her cut through a divorce settlement. So, Diana had spent weeks putting together her plan to have Peggy murdered. And then she had paid someone to come on as a partner to help her set everything up. The plan Diana conceived was purposefully convoluted, because she thought that would throw police off of her scent. But the phone records, and specifically her use of the burner phone, had allowed investigators to totally unravel Diana's plan. Phone data analyst Robin Arias had discovered the use of the burner phone and had tracked its purchase to a shop in Florida just minutes away from where Diana lived. It turned out Diana had not been the one who actually physically bought the phone, but using surveillance footage, investigators were able to track down the woman who had bought the phone. And when police questioned that woman, she said Diana had paid her money to buy the burner and hand it over. And so with the burner in her possession, Diana had told her family, and later had told police, that she flew to Washington, D.C. for a wedding. 
But in reality, Diana had flown to D.C. to meet a woman who had been recruited by Diana's partner to actually carry out the murder for $10,000. That woman met Diana at the airport in D.C., and they both drove several hours to New York to kill Peggy. Police believe Diana really wanted this woman to kill Peggy on her own while Diana just supervised. That way she wouldn't have to actually murder her mother-in-law, who she had been close with for years. But in the heat of the moment, when the hired killer, or the driver, failed to strangle Peggy to death, Diana, who had been the passenger in the car, had acted on instinct and bludgeoned Peggy and then stabbed her to death. Diana believed that involving other people to set up and carry out this murder would help distance herself from the crime and maybe keep her out of trouble. But as investigators put together all the puzzle pieces, everybody else involved in this crime pointed the finger directly at Diana. The woman who was hired to kill Peggy for money and who tried unsuccessfully to strangle Peggy to death cut a plea deal and was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. And while she was awaiting her murder trial in prison, Diana was recorded making phone calls trying to arrange the murders of two witnesses who could testify against her. Diana was found guilty of plotting to murder those witnesses, and as a result was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Then she was also found guilty of second-degree murder in Peggy's case and received an additional sentence of 23 years to life in prison. Peggy is buried outside of the small quaint town where she spent 50 years of her life. With all of the things that Peggy accomplished in her career and her education, there was still just one thing that mattered to her above everything else, her own family. And so Peggy's headstone is very simple. It just says, wife, mother, grandmother. In 2006, a 14-year-old boy named Eben lived on a farm in North Carolina. This was not a typical farm with animals and crops. It was a pine tree harvestry. Pine needles are a big landscaping commodity, and Evan and his family made their living baling pine straw every year. As such, their main living house on the farm was situated right in the middle of 550 acres of perfectly lined up pine trees. They did not have any neighbors nearby, and there was only one road that led into the property, which from the main house, they could look out and basically see through the rows of trees all the way to the beginning of this road, which meant any visitors were really easy to spot. The main house was built on a very slight hill, which meant one side of the house was effectively built on stilts to compensate for the angle. And on that side of the house, on the first floor, was the living room. So anyone who was in the living room looking out the window, they basically need to look at a downward angle to see the ground. It would actually seem like you were on the second floor, but really you're on the first floor. The window in the living room was very unique. It stretched almost the entire length of the room, so almost 50 feet across. And at night, you could see animals darting between the different trees because you could see down the rows. And so that was pretty creepy. And then just the fact that this window is so big, if you're in the living room at night, you just felt really exposed. So between the creepy animals running around and a level of exposure and vulnerability, people basically avoided the living room anytime they were in the house at night. That winter, Evan's cousin came to stay with him on his farm, and because the main house did not have any extra bedrooms, Evan and his cousin would have to sleep in the living room. There were two couches inside of the living room, one that was right underneath the 50-foot-long window, and then another which was on the other side of the room against a wall that did not have a window. And so Evan would be sleeping on the couch right under the window, and his cousin would be sleeping on the other couch. The first night Evan's cousin was there, they put this big sheet up over the window, but it only blocked like 75% of the window. The two flanks of the window were still exposed, but where the couches were lined up, they were kind of blocked by this sheet, so it gave them a little bit of privacy. After goofing around for a while, the boys finally fell asleep around midnight, and then they woke up a couple hours later because they heard Evan's dogs barking way off in the pine trees. Now, Evan was used to his dogs running around the property and barking at other smaller animals, and so just them barking was not necessarily a red flag. But the barking persisted to the point where Evan's cousin got up off the couch, moved across the room to the opening of the window that was not covered by the sheet, at the foot of where Evan was sleeping. Now, Evan was still laying on the couch. He was not going to get up and look out the window, so he's looking down at his cousin, kind of looking at his face to get some sort of a read on what he's seeing. And he notices his cousin has this really perplexed look on his face, like he's squinting his eyes and trying to make sense of what he's looking at. And so Evan looks at him and says, hey, what's going on? What do you see? 
And his cousin's like, I don't know if my mind's playing tricks on me or not, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I see people out there. At this, Evan jumps off the couch and runs over and butts up right next to his cousin so he can look out the window too. And he's scanning out amongst the rows of trees because there's just a mile of pine trees. And the first thing he notices is the moon is very bright that night. So there's good illumination and there was a light snow covering on the ground, which really added to the illumination. He's looking out maybe a hundred meters when he sees someone's leg extend from behind one of the pine trees as if they're stepping into the space between a pine tree column. And he's staring at it and he can't believe he's even seeing anyone walking around this area because he didn't see anybody come in on the road and they have no neighbors. And so he's looking and then a body follows the leg. A person walks from one row to the next. This tall, dark figure just walks calm as can be between the two pine trees. And Evan just grabs his cousin and he's like, did you just see that? And his cousin's like, yeah, I saw that. And so they continue to look in the direction of where this person crossed the path. And after a couple of minutes, they see another leg now emerging, going the other way back towards where that first person had come from. So the leg kind of extends into this gap and this tall figure walks across into the next row, except now instead of going just directly across, it looks like they're moving at an angle closer to the main house property. The boys look at each other and they don't know what to do, so they just keep looking out the window in stunned silence. And as they're looking, they see this person emerge again, except now they're not 100 meters away, they're like 20 meters away. They don't know how they were able to move that quickly without being seen. And this time when the leg comes out from behind the pine tree, instead of walking across the gap, it stops right in the middle and it turns and it looks directly at the boys in the window and then begins running toward them. The boys practically fall over trying to get away from the window. Evan's yelling for his father upstairs and the boys instinctively just start running around the house, locking every door, shutting every window. And as they're going from door to door, the anxiety is growing and growing because they think if I don't get there fast enough, this person who was running towards the property is gonna come barging through that door. And so at every door, their anxiety is through the roof, but they manage to shut everything. Everything is locked right as Evan's father comes charging down the stairs. He's got his gun in hand and he's like, what's going on? And they say, there's someone out in our property. Their dad charges out the front door. The front door is not on the same wall as the living room. It's on the side of the house. So once he goes outside, he's gonna need to turn to the right to look out in the direction they were describing. He bombs outside, he stays in the porch, and he starts yelling at whoever's out there that if you come over here, I'm gonna shoot you, get the F away from here. And then there's silence. And the boys are waiting, they're looking around, they're checking the window, they don't see anything. The dad comes back inside, he shut and locks the door, and he tells Evan, keep an eye out, if you see him again, you let me know. Evan would reflect on this experience later on and say, you know, we really should have called 911 at that point. But as a kid, I just understood that that's the way my family did business. We kind of took care of ourselves. And so even though there is a threat of some stranger who's running at our property, we were not going to call the cops. And so his dad effectively was telling him to be a lookout. And so Evan and his cousin, they go back into the living room and they kind of go up to the window. They're a little bit apprehensive and they're looking out. And, and after five, 10 minutes of looking out the window and not seeing anything, they're thinking to themselves, you know, Evan's dad's a pretty intimidating guy. And he was just out there screaming and yelling with a gun, threatening to shoot them. So they probably got the message and they're probably gone. And so the boys got back into their couches and it took them a while, but they did ultimately fall asleep. The next morning when the boys got up, the first thing they wanted to do was go out there and see if they could find footprints from this person to kind of confirm it really was a person because part of them thought, you know, maybe we didn't see that. Maybe that was our imaginations. They don't know. And so they start by going out the front door. So not on the same wall as the living room. They go out the front door, they turn and they walk down into the trees and they're looking around and they find some footprints. So they're confirming to themselves, okay, there was someone out here. It wasn't us. This is not our footprints. We found them. So they start following the footprints back towards the property. And they realize at some point there are two distinct sets of footprints. There were two people out here. And even worse is they followed them all the way up to the house. And there were two different circles of footprints that stopped right underneath the living room window along the two flanks of the window where the sheet was not covering. Which means over the course of the night when Evan and his cousin were up at that window looking out, there's a good chance that one or two strangers were tucked up against the side of the house. And they would not have seen them because of the angle out of the living room window. It was steep because of the stilts it was on. And so anybody that was tucked up along the side, they'd be in a blind spot. And then for sure, after Evan and his cousin got back into bed and were sleeping, there were two strangers who were right up against those windows, probably pulling themselves up to look inside. 
When Evan's father found these footprints, he immediately grabbed his gun and tried to follow them back into the woods to see where they came from, but unfortunately the snow cover wasn't complete, and at some point they lost the tracks, and they never figured out who those two people were. Evan would say, following this event, his cousin refused to ever come back over his house for a sleepover. The next and final story of today's episode is called Tin Tenabulation. In June of 2019, an 18-year-old girl named Bella wrapped up her first year in college and headed home for the summer. Her family lived just outside of this small town in France that was tucked up in the mountains and surrounded by this huge forest. And so growing up, Bella spent a lot of her time out in this forest, either by herself or with her father or other members of her family. And so she knew the forest like the back of her hand. Her favorite place to go in this forest was the man-made lake that sat kind of at the center of this forest. It wasn't huge, but it was a beautiful view, it was very peaceful, and so she liked going out there. The way she would get to it is she would leave her house, she would hop in her car, she would drive a couple of miles down the road, and she would pull off into the shoulder of this road, and there was no signage that said this was the pull-off to get to the man-made lake. This was an area that she and her family had discovered, that there was this particular trail you could take. And so she would pull off at this shoulder, she would get out, and she would turn away from the road and just walk directly into the trees, which butted right up against the road. And very quickly, after walking into the woods, after going through some thick underbrush, she would reach this kind of clearing, and she would see up ahead this little stream. And off to the left side of the stream is what looked like this kind of beaten up little footpath, but actually what it was was an animal trail. So animals just kind of made their way around this area all the time, and so it kind of carved out a path. And so Bella would walk down to this animal path, and she would walk along the path that kind of went parallel with the stream, and she would walk for maybe 15 or 20 minutes until this animal path veered hard to the left, kind of went away from the stream. At that point, Bella would abandon the animal path and just continue walking along this stream, both stepping in the stream on some rocks and standing on either side when she could. And she would follow the stream due north, just going straight into the heart of this forest for about an hour, walking at a fairly leisurely pace until the stream connected with this east to west running river. And at this point, Bella would turn left facing west and she would follow along this river bank about 20 minutes until the river fed into the man-made lake. And so she would stay at this lake, sitting on a rock, enjoy the view and look at the animals and listen to nature all around her. And then at some point she would turn around and retrace her steps all the way back to her car. For reference, one leg of this journey from car to lake or from lake to car took about two hours. Part of the reason Bella really enjoyed being in these woods and being at this lake was because it just kind of felt like they were hers. Because up until this summer in 2019, the only other people that Bella had ever seen anywhere in this forest or near this lake were other members of her family. So it really felt very private. So in June of that year, Bella comes home from college and almost immediately she wants to go out to the man-made lake because she hasn't been in months, she's been in school, and so she's eager to get back to some place that she kind of considered to be her happy place. So one morning she gets up early and by herself, she leaves her house, she hops in her car, she drives the couple miles down the road, she pulls off onto that shoulder, she parks her car, she hops out, she turns away from the road, she walks into the forest, she finds the stream and starts walking along that animal path right to the side of the stream. She walks for a few minutes until she reaches the point where the trail kind of cuts to the left and she just stays on the stream and is just continuing walking along the stream. And about 30 minutes later, when she was maybe one or two miles short of the east-west running river. She hears a bell somewhere off in the distance, way out in front of her, out towards the river. It sounds just like a chime, a single chime. And as soon as she hears it, she stops because there's never any people out here ever. And that bell sound came from somewhere in the forest. And so she stops because she's not really sure if she actually heard that because it could have just been her mind playing tricks on her or something. And so she stops and just kind of listens for a second. And then she starts to hear this bell just continuously start ringing. Now, the ringing was not uniform. It was constant, but it was kind of sporadic, as if you were holding a bell and kind of ringing it randomly, like you might see at a sports game. And so she's thinking to herself, you know, is there a, a dog that got lost somewhere up ahead and it's got a bell on its collar and, and that's the sound I'm hearing? But as she's sitting there listening to this kind of sporadic bell sound, she's thinking, that's way too loud to be some rinky-dink bell on a pet's collar. So it's got to be something more robust. 
Maybe somebody have a bell inside of a box and that box got on the river and it's floated down river and it's like crashing into rocks or something. I mean, she's going through these very strange scenarios in her head, but she's not concerned about the bell. She's actually pretty intrigued. And since the sound of this bell seemed to be coming from the direction she was already traveling, she decided she would just keep on walking and hopefully see whatever it was that was causing this bell sound. And so Bella just began walking along the stream again, kind of listening to this bell and thinking about what it was going to be. And after about five minutes of her starting to walk again, the bell just stops. It goes totally silent. And when it does, it actually kind of startles Bella because she'd been listening to it so intently. And so she stops and she's listening, kind of expecting it to go off some more, but it doesn't. All she hears are the sounds of nature all around her. Now, Bella didn't have an explanation for what the spell was or why it stopped, but she really just wasn't that worried about it. She figured there was some sort of explanation for it. There had to be. And so she just kind of shrugged and kept on walking and put her focus back on getting to the lake. About 10 or 15 minutes later, Bella was still walking along the stream. She was still maybe a half mile or a mile short of the east to west running river. When she sees up ahead on the left side of the stream as she's walking, there appears to be something laying on the ground that looks like it could be an animal or a rock. She doesn't really know what it is. And as she gets closer, she realizes it's a beaver laying on the ground and this beaver is missing its head. Now, this is a huge forest, and Bella would have known that, you know, of course, there are wild animals all over the place, and so finding the body of an animal that had been attacked by another animal was not unusual. That's nature. But what did strike Bella as odd was the cut on this beaver's neck was unbelievably neat and uniform, as if its head had been very carefully removed with a very sharp knife. And the beaver's head was nowhere to be found. It certainly did not have the appearance of having its head removed from some predator and its teeth. That would have been very rough. Also, the rest of the beaver's body was intact, so whatever killed this beaver was not interested in eating the beaver. As Bella stood over this beaver and was just staring at it, she also noted that there was no smell. Normally, when something dies, it begins to smell very quickly. It's part of the decomposition process. And so for there not to be a smell indicated to Bella that this beaver must have been killed fairly recently. And then when Bella kind of gently prodded the body with her foot, she realized the beaver's body was still fairly limp, so rigor mortis had not set in. Rigor mortis is another part of the decomposition process where the body kind of stiffens up, and that happens fairly soon after death. And so as Bella is realizing this beaver must have died very recently, it dawns on her that most likely whoever or whatever has killed this beaver is probably somewhere nearby. And Bella can't help but connect this dead beaver to that bell she was hearing earlier, which before meant nothing, but considering the bell was roughly coming from the same area where this beaver has now been found, it made her uneasy. And so Bella found herself whipping her head around, looking out into the trees, seeing if, you know, there's some person, a hunter or somebody that would kind of explain what was going on, but there was nothing. And so Bella felt herself starting to panic a little bit, but then she stopped herself and said, calm down, it's broad daylight. I have been coming to these woods for years and years. I've never seen another person. I've never encountered some predatory animal. I'm sure everything is perfectly fine. I got nothing to worry about. And so she stepped over the beaver and kept on walking. Bella would eventually reach the east-west running river. She would turn left and walk for 20 minutes alongside this river. She'd reach the man-made lake. She enjoyed the beautiful view and the scenery. And then at some point, she turned around and began retracing her footsteps. She walked past the beaver on the ground all the way back to her car, and she went home. A week later, Bella was sitting around her house when she felt pretty bored and decided kind of abruptly that in order to cure her boredom, she would go back to the place she loved so much, the man-made lake. And so she told her parents where she was going, and then she left the house, hopped in her car, drove to the pull-off, and parked, and entered the woods at 6 p.m. Sunset that night was at 9 p.m., and so Bella knew this would need to be a fairly quick turnaround so she didn't get trapped in the woods in the dark. And so Bella finds the animal trail. She follows along the stream until the trail goes left and she stays on the stream. She continues walking on the stream when she starts to hear the distant sound of thunder. And so she looks up into the sky through the trees and she can see the sky is starting to get dark, but she's still a couple of hours away from sunset. And so between the thunder and the dark skies, she knows a storm is rolling in. But she is determined to get to that lake. And so instead of, you know, turning around and saying, okay, I'll come back another time, she just starts jogging along the stream to get there as fast as she possibly can. And almost immediately as she's jogging, the raindrops start to fall. And by the time she passes the beaver corpse on the ground, it hadn't moved, 
the rain was really coming down. And then about 15 minutes after the corpse, when she hit the east-west running river, that's when the rain was at a full downpour. Still, Bella turned at the river and continued west towards the man-made lake as if she was going to go all the way, but only about a minute or two into this final leg. She still had about 20 minutes to get to the lake. She stops herself and she looks at her watch and she can see it's after 8 o'clock already. And she's thinking to herself, you know, if I turn around right now, it's going to take me over an hour to get back to my car. Sun sets at 9 p.m. It's after 8 p.m. now. So already I know I'm going to have to navigate this forest at night in the dark, even if it's just for a little bit at the end. And if I go all the way to the lake and then come all the way back to the car, I'm going to be in the forest after dark for quite a while, maybe up to an hour. And she's thinking, you know, I'm confident I can do that, but it's also pouring rain. I'm cold. If I get lost, this could turn into a very bad situation. And so she ultimately decides that even though she really wants to keep going, she needs to turn around. She needs to head back. And so she turns around and she walks back up alongside this east-west running river to where the stream fed into that river. She turns and begins walking south along the stream headed back towards the car. On her walk, because the visibility was starting to get quite bad because it was so dark, she had her head down at the ground because she didn't want to trip. She's stepping on rocks. She's stepping on muddy areas. She wants to make sure her footing is solid. And so her head is down. The rain is pounding all around her. And she's walking for about 15 minutes when all of a sudden something hits her in the top of the head. And so reflexively, she looks up and kind of puts her hands in front of her face to protect herself. And she sees what she had just run into. It was the beaver corpse. It was hanging from a string that was dangling off a branch right above her. And this beaver's head had been retrieved and the head had been stitched onto the front paws of this beaver. And so she's looking at this beaver that's dangling from this rope. It's carrying its own head and she's walked square into it. And her first reaction was basically to gag. She was going to vomit. She was so disgusted. And then she began frantically rubbing at her hair where this thing had made contact with her because there could be juices from the decomposition that got on her. And then after frantically kind of patting at her head for a second, she stops and something really terrifying dawns on her. Whoever strung this beaver up to this tree and then stitched its head onto its paws, they had done that in the last 30 minutes. Because 30 minutes earlier, when she was on her way in, she remembered passing the beaver carcass on the ground. She saw it. It had not moved from where it was the week before when she first saw it. And now this beaver is strung up in the tree. And so as the wheels are turning in Bella's head, she realizes that if someone has just done this, then they are probably nearby. And at this point, it's really starting to get dark. The rain is pounding all around her. And she starts whipping her head around, looking in all directions to see if there's someone out there that did this. But as she's looking, all she sees is just dark forest in all directions. And she knows she's at least one hour, even if she runs from her car. And so suddenly, she is totally panicked. And in an effort to calm herself down, she says to herself, OK, I need to get out of here, but I have to walk. If I start running right now, this is going to turn into a complete nightmare. I, I just have to try to walk. And so she walks around this dangling beaver corpse and starts walking along the stream. And as soon as she's past that corpse, she feels the hairs on the back of her neck stand up. She can hear movement behind her. She doesn't know what it is. It could be a deer. It could be some animal, but she's too afraid to turn around. And even though she was trying to tell herself to calm down, just keep walking. You're safe. You're freaking yourself out. Everything is okay. As she's walking, she could feel herself starting to speed up until finally she was just running down the stream, sprinting actually away from this beaver and whatever it was that was moving around in that area. And at some point, she got so winded from sprinting so fast that she came to a stop maybe five or six minutes after seeing this beaver. And as soon as she comes to a stop and she's walking, she still hasn't turned around yet. She hears the sound of that bell. And right away, it's the exact same sound she had heard the week before. It's that kind of constant sporadic sound of someone ringing a bell. But in her panicked state, she doesn't know where it's coming from. She's so scared. Her anxiety is so high. She doesn't know if it's behind her or if it's off to the side. It's now completely dark out. And so she is full blown terrified. There is someone or something behind her that has strung this beaver up that's probably watching her and she can't see them. 
Even though she's beyond winded, she can barely breathe. She just starts sprinting as fast as she can. And as she's stumbling and falling on the rocks and tripping because she's not really looking where she's going, in the background and all around her, she's hearing this bell chiming and she's hearing something moving around in the woods behind her. And she pulls her phone out of her pocket, her iPhone. And as she's running, she dials her father. She puts the phone to her ear. She's crying. She's panting. She can barely breathe. Her father picks up and she's so relieved to hear his voice, but she can't even make a sentence. She just starts crying and wailing and pleading with him, Dad, come out to the forest. Meet me at the spot where the trail veers away from the stream. Meet me there. There's someone in the forest that's chasing me and I can't see them. Her father on the other end of the phone, he didn't know what to make of this, but he could hear the primal fear in his daughter's voice. And so he didn't ask any questions. He said, stay on the line. I'm coming to meet you right now. So Bella's father and mother with Bella on the line, they run out of their house, they hop in their car, they speed the couple miles down the road, they park next to their daughter's car, and as they're running into the woods, they can hear way off in the woods the sound of the bell. They can hear the bell, they hear their daughter screaming on the phone, they can hear the bell coming through the phone, and she's begging them to please come into the woods, come in here, save me. And so the parents run into the woods and they begin running up the stream. Meanwhile, Bella, who's way out in the woods, she's still 10 or 15 minutes away from her parents. She is barely able to run at this point. She's exhausted almost all of her energy. And as she's getting closer and closer to her parents, the sporadic bell sound is getting louder and louder and louder, like whatever it is, is gaining on her. And she can hear behind her all these sticks and branches. They're breaking as if something is coming up to her. And finally, when it feels like this bell is right behind her head, she just kind of stops in defeat. She's too far away from her parents. She can't get to them in time. And so it was almost like she had to turn around and find finally look at whatever it was that was behind her. And so terrified beyond words, Bella, who can barely breathe, she's so scared and so tired, she slowly turns around. Now, when she turns around and she's facing the other direction, she's looking across this clearing. She just happened to run past this clearing. And because it was a clearing, there was a little bit of moonlight that was coming down through the trees, just enough to illuminate this space that was about 50 feet wide. And as she's looking across this clearing, at first, she doesn't see anything. And then this tall, dark figure walks into the clearing. And as soon as it steps in, she can see it's got a bell at its waist. And with every step it took, it would violently ring the bell, causing the ringing sound. And so this thing starts moving into the clearing. And as Bella is staring at it, it was like time slowed down. She could not process what she was looking at. She didn't know what she was looking at. All she knew is whatever or whoever this is, they're coming straight at me. And so Bella suddenly got this unbelievable adrenaline rush. It was like her body went into autopilot to save her. And she turned around and began sprinting faster than she'd ever sprinted in her life. And as she ran, all she could hear was the sound of that bell, which she now knew represented steps this thing was taking. And so the bell was getting faster and faster and louder and louder. And she knew it was gaining on her. And she began lying and screaming out loud that I'm on the phone with the police. They're right up ahead. They're going to be here any moment. But whatever it was that was behind her, they weren't phased. They were just charging ahead, gaining on her second by second. Meanwhile, her parents had made it to the meeting spot, but her father, he felt like, I can't just sit here. And he just starts charging into the woods. He can hear his daughter screaming. He can hear this bell getting louder and louder. And he just starts running towards it. And sure enough, seconds later, he sees his daughter come bounding out of the forest and she leaps into his arms. He just grabs her, turns around and runs with her back to the meeting spot. He grabs his wife and the three of them just charge out of the forest, back to the parking lot, back in their car and they speed off. In the car, all of them are crying. They don't know what to make of what just happened. Bella's trying to describe it, but she can't. And her parents, they had been on the phone listening to their daughter screaming. And all they kept saying to each other, the parents was, I heard the bell. I heard the bell. I heard the bell. As if the bell confirmed their worst nightmares, that there really was someone or something out in those woods that was trying to do harm to their child. They would drive straight to the police station where Bella would file a report about what she experienced out in the forest. And then afterwards, her parents, as a precaution, took her to the hospital where she was determined to be okay, besides some bumps and bruises from falling down. The following morning, the police went out to the forest, to the area where Bella had explained where she had been, and they searched all along that animal foot trail and all along the stream, but they never found any sign of this dark figure with the bell. Bella would tell police that she had a handbag, and as she was running back, she dropped the bag. She remembered where she dropped it along the stream, but when the police went to that area, the bag was gone. Also, the beaver was no longer there. It was not tied up to the tree. It was not on the ground. It was gone. 
The only thing police found that was out of the ordinary was they found a little ways off from the stream, basically along the path that Bella would have been running on, they found a t-shirt neatly folded placed underneath a rock. But the police and Bella and her family have no idea what that signifies. Ultimately, the police told Bella and her family that more than likely what she ran into was some kind of mentally unstable person that was living out in the woods. And perhaps when Bella came into the woods, they felt like she was on their property. And so they kind of tried to scare her off. But Bella has a hard time accepting that. She felt like as she was running from whoever was behind her, that she was in mortal danger. That had it not been for her father running into the woods and literally grabbing her and running with her the rest of the way, that she may not have gotten out of the woods at all. That she might have been attacked and killed by whoever this was. She also can't help when she looks back at the entire experience, thinking about that moment when she turned around and looked across that clearing and saw this figure come into the moonlight for the first time, that when it came into the moonlight, the way it was moving, the steps it was taking, they weren't normal, they were abnormal. There was just something off about this thing's movement that it didn't seem like she was looking at a person, but rather some big animal. But regardless, since her ordeal, there have been no strange sightings out in those woods. However, almost no one ever goes in those woods except for Bella and her family. And Bella and her family, they don't go in those woods anymore. So whoever or whatever is out there is still just out there. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please text the Amazon Music Follow button that you have something extremely important to tell them. Then text them a GIF of the typing dots. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that honors and supports victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.